So hello again. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, basically uh, content that people can watch, listen to, you know, podcasts, creator channels on various streaming services, and how you spot the good stuff from the bad stuff, basically. If you don't have the skills to spot the good from the bad, you can see that things might have gone awry and the world is going to hell in a handbasket, so to speak, or all of science is now upended or those sorts of things. And that's reactionism. The goal here is to empower you with the tools to immunize you from easy reactionism response. So uh, the title is not purposefully clickbait. I wanted it to be, be terse, a couple of words. Once you uh, go through the process of learning what I want to talk about, it'll probably be something that will help you out. So I'm going to keep the scope of the presentation to science communication, uh, you know, astronomy, physics, all that kinds of stuff, which might include historical events, timeline of the Earth, technology advancements, uh, how the solar system came into existence, uh, galaxies and universes and such. I'm going to purposefully exclude politics and religion, uh, which might exhibit the same reactionism stuff. So what you learn here may actually uh, affect how you view more than just science communication. Or uh, sorry if you wind up uh, consuming a red pill and now your world is forever changed. So I, I like to think of it as unsavvy consumers versus public megaphones. The general public is not uh, expected to be well-versed, uh, certainly not deeply in aspects of science. I mean, they might have had some science curriculum as they were going through their uh, primary education, but that was maybe a long time ago, you know, touching on things like physics or astronomy or chemistry or math. And if they were lucky in high school, they probably went through, you know, something like debating or uh, operations research or rational analysis or something to that effect where, you know, they learn how to spot good stuff from bad stuff. If they did, maybe they'd forget it. If they never did it, they have no experience with how to separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. Or, you know, they maybe had no exposure to the scientific method and its value. So they might be unaware of it or untrusting of it. They're more likely to emotionally react to things that they see, especially if there's some hysteria in the presenter in the content. So here's a list of sort of how I grade things. YouTube, oh, so many channels, wide range of content creators, some of them with little to no education on what they're talking about. Twitter or um, not well thought out brain farts, often just like a knee jerk comment. And uh, if you had to retain these for the rest of your life, you'd probably eventually regret it. Uh, it it's kind of like uh, foot in mouth disease. Facebook, I, I, you know, Facebook is starting to to fall down to the original intent for it. Personal social communication. Um, I'm not seeing as much of the other stuff there. More of that's fallen to Twitter. And if it's purposed content, it's fallen to YouTube. TikTok, that's for the folks when X is just way too deep for them. I, the way I describe it is, yes, I have a TikTok account. I just run screaming from it. It's just like, no. Strangely enough, uh, TV channels and video streaming services that are networks and such, um, for the most part, they try and avoid... Um, intense misinformation. Some are a little closer to that edge, but I would say they're probably paying more attention to the potential for corporate losses associated with uh, liability lawsuits or defamation lawsuits. So grades, shades of gray there. So let, let's say people make assumptions when they're looking at content. Just because somebody has a world accessible public megaphone that costs them nothing, did you know to set up a YouTube channel cost you nothing? So anybody with an email address and a little bit of technical savvy can set up a YouTube channel. And if they don't edit the video, they just post it directly from their phone to their computer, boop, drop it right, right on YouTube. Yeah, more savvy ones will, like myself, will edit out the bloopers. Some of them are so proud of the bloopers. They At their end of the content, they have a blooper reel that shows you all of their missteps. Sometimes you'll see content where it sounds very impressive. They'll do like a technical word salad 
on some topic, which makes it sound like they know what they're talking about, but maybe not. It's like uh, Back to the Future when they describe the flux capacitor, like, oh, okay, it sounds technical, but what is that? Or in Star Trek The Next Generation, when people doubted the transporters would ever work, oh, they work because they have a Heisenberg uncertainty compensator. Sounds impressive, but it, that doesn't exist. But, you know, techie word salad can often make it appear as though the content creator actually knows what they're talking about, but not really. Um, you know, there's very little scrutiny of content. There's no assurance of it being peer-reviewed or fact-checked. Sometimes a uh, YouTube channel um, will have comments because if you want your channel to be monetized, there is a requirement by YouTube for your comments to be enabled. Now, I enable comments, but I hold them for responses. So I can get a bunch of comments in because I said something, duh. And I can walk through all of that and then fact check myself and go, yeah, I got that wrong. That was a, and then I can go in and put in a correction, usually in the information section, or I'll comment on my own content without going through the uh, 30 people that say, I'm, uh, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I'm a moron. And that just gets you nothing. So, yes, sometimes I get trolls, but very few because I'm not that. I'm not a million seller channel kind of thing. I'll accept comments and then I'll go through the fact check and put in notes that say, yep, got that wrong. Yeah, you're correct. Uh, people might think that things like promotional marks, colored checks and things like that say, well, obviously they're telling the truth. They've got a, a green or a blue or whatever check mark. Like, no, you just, you submit your credentials and you pay them an annual fee and voila, you get a check mark. But that there's no assurance that your content's actually fact checked or peer reviewed. And if it's really bad, I guess they could probably rescind your check mark. But I've never seen that happen. Even if the comments are uh, fact checking, there's no assurance that the correction will occur or removal of misleading content after it's already been published. The internet has a memory. The creators are presuming they have. No liability risk. Uh, if they say something wrong, oh, my bad. Or sometimes they'll just say something completely wrong and leave it in there. And maybe somebody comments, maybe somebody doesn't comment, but they just go on like nothing happened. So the corrective effort has to be on the consuming or the receiving end of communication. You can't expect all creators to put out good stuff. Most of them put out, eh stuff and most of them don't correct when comments come in what's the old saying buyer beware in this case viewer or listener beware i like to think of it as there's there's different gradations different levels of uh, responsible content creation if they're peer-reviewed or verified that's good but that's not 100 percent assurance as like some of the science YouTube channels will say, yeah, I know it was peer reviewed, but who identifies the review process for reviewers? Well, you just presume, presume that, you know, that prestigious university is getting reviewers that are good. Most of those reviewers are not paid. Most of those reviewers just go, well, at least you got a degree in something similar. But that's not an assurance that you're a subject matter expert. So they'll look for basic stuff. Um, oh, you you quoted somebody here. Do you have a link to where you quoted it from? Machine kinds of things. Is what is being said a consensus opinion? If you find out of the you know millions of YouTube channels out there, this is the only person saying this. It's not because they're enlightened by information not available to anyone else. It's because what they're saying is questionable. So when somebody says something, did you see other content creators saying oh, the same thing? Not an assurance because all the ducks in a row could be going out into traffic. Consensus opinion is an improvement, but not an assurance. They could be inaccurate simply because it's unintentional. They don't have the appropriate 
training or experience to communicate the content that they're actually communicating. They have the skills to go watch other people's content, extract from it, you know, get some stuff on Wikipedia, like I often do, and then put it out there. And they're, they're inaccurate. But it's an intentional inaccuracy. They're just not a subject matter expert. If they were, maybe they wouldn't be saying some of the things that they're saying. Misleading or misinformation doesn't have to be deliberate. But the better ones will actually say, oh, yeah, I got that wrong, and then correct the information. And then there's the ones that are purely disinformational. This is deliberately inaccurate in order to create an intended, an intended opinion on those consuming the content. Um, like, for example, when you're being given a grant to investigate something, and what you're investigating is questionable or unobservable, and then you put out a report saying, Yep, we've, we've still once again confirmed that we can't observe this. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That just means you've not observed it. And we'll get into the distinction between those two things. But you're deliberately putting something out there that is misleading in order to enrich yourself. And then there are the conspiracy theory folks. Anytime you watch some content, it refers to they them or concealment by governments bring along your large bag of salt however governments have been known to keep secrets if you doubt this i've i've got a link at the end regarding the glomar explorer that's a fun read and if you think people aren't paid to purposefully mislead others then i've also got a link uh, uh, about a uh, disinformation source by the name of Richard Doty, who was actually paid by the military to uh, create misinformation amongst uh, UAP observers. <laughs> Again, it's a fun read. But sometimes uh, conspiracy is what it is. Uh, Henry Kissinger, in a Newsweek article back from 1983, uh, he said, in print, even a paranoid has some real enemies. Which I always like. I've got it on the wall over there. It's a little placard. I keep, you know, even a paranoid has some real enemies. Uh, and then I was watching the movie Club Paradise with Robin Williams, and he was put into jail just to prove a point by uh, the guys out to get him. And he comes out and he tells his girlfriend, I got all paranoid and thought people were out to get me. Now I know they are. Uh, but I also like to think of it as I never concern myself with government surveillance of whatever I do. Because if they want to, they will. I might not know about it, but I might know about it. Now, if I know about it, I'm not going to tell them. So, you know, if somebody's listening in to what I'm putting out there on YouTube because they want to keep a good eye on what I'm doing and then step in at the right moment, um, I'm not Nikola Tesla, folks. So what's the best self-defense against this uh, flow of misinformation? There's no assurance that you'll be completely immune from it, but you can at least improve things. Um, we're going to have to do whatever corrective action we're going to do on the consuming end, watching, listening, make the listener uh, more astute, so to speak, immunize the recipients of the information to keep them from falling into the deep crevasse of believing something is accurate simply because... Somebody had the ability to create and publish it. You know, like I said, anybody can get a YouTube channel with an email address or that you have the ability to consume it. Not only did they create it easily, you had the ability to consume it easily. Doesn't cost you anything. You can have YouTube on your laptop, on your mobile, on, on your TV set. Um, lots of content out there. Lots of podcasts that people can watch or listen to. Don't presume that the content is accurate simply because a particular item has lots of views. Hey, I've got over a thousand views on a couple of my videos. Does that mean that everything that I say is perfection? I would say no. I would say a lot of it is as good as I could make it, but sometimes I can get it wrong. That's why there are comments. 
because a creator has lots of subscribers or followers or likes, which may get into the millions, those are easy to come by. You may not know this, but for about $200, you can pay a mobile phone army of automated mobile phones to go in and like, 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 like a particular video. It's a paid service fee. So if you want instantly 250,000 uh, watches or follows or likes, that's that's a reasonably cheap thing to do, which is why there are so many troll farms out there because they're creating content. And once they create the content, they just pay the service fee and have lots of people that are computerized mobile phones watch it. And they watch it all the way from front to, bit to the end. So they're really intent on watching the content when there's actually nobody there. But you can do that. So when you see some, you know, really questionable content, how is it that this thing has a million people that have watched this? Because it wasn't really a million people. It might have been a thousand people that watched it, but the other 999,999 were all bots. When you look at a video and you see something like a check mark or a YouTube plaque in the background, be it uh, silver or gold, um, that's not... Uh, guarantee that all the videos and all the content they've ever created are fully factual or reviewed. Spot misinformation when you see it. Comment on it. Don't get too bent if they take it offense to your commenting. Don't get too offensive in your comment. Just short, terse, sweet, you know, I think this is incorrect, and then state what it is. And then if you have substantiating information to your position, include the link in the comment. So, you know, I think this is incorrect. Here's the information. Whenever you see content and it's just somebody blathering on without all those hyperlinks that I put at the end, ask them where they get their information from. They might be getting it from another podcast or YouTube channel that's equally not that reliable. Well, I saw it on, on this guy's channel, so it must be true because he's got 2 million followers. Not necessarily. So know the source of the content. They may not be educated in it. They may not even have the ability to uh, rationally analyze the content that they're creating. So they may be just repeating what they heard elsewhere without ever questioning their original source. The ones that get me are, are the ones that have some proclamation that they're they're counter to the mainstream whatever. And they'll say like, see, they're wrong. So there, I told you so. I was right all along. Like, okay, 50 pound bag of salt when you're watching that kind of stuff. However, there are topics in science that science is corrected later. Like originally neutrinos were Theoretical, because nobody proved that they actually existed. They were inferred because we had some missing energy in fusion calculations for stars. And then uh, it took us a while before we detected them. And once we detected them, they went, yeah, yeah, look, that's missing energy. So they filled in a problem. But initially, no, nah, it can't, can't exist. Uh, unseen particles that aren't in our table? No, that can't be. Not only did they find out that neutrinos exist, but they also found out they come in different flavors or different types. And that the different types have different ranges of energy. And then they found out later on, oh, they actually flip. They'll change from one flavor to another. The scientific method says, when you have observations that affect your established conclusions, Go back and adjust things to accommodate them. A simplest example is Newtonian gravity, relativity. Einstein comes along, didn't really like splats out Newton's work, just said, well, that works under these circumstances. But when you want to go really fast or have really large things, this guy over here named Einstein, his approach works better. So, so if a source re resorts to techie word salad, especially if they proclaim, well, I'm I'm not a scientist or I'm not educated in this, but here's my opinion. Like, okay, uh, 
time for your 50 pound bag of salt again. If, if you yourself, when you created your content said, I'm not an expert in this, but, or says, well, I don't really understand it all, but okay. You might want to ask them who their sources are and go find out uh, from the source, so to speak. And then my favorite, and I, as, as someone who's uh, versed in software, I've seen the progression of these things. Text to speech, uh, artificial or artificial general intelligence, uh, virtualized avatars, and bots. How you spot these things is getting more and more difficult. It used to be just listen to what's being said. And if you have inconsistent mispronunciations or punctuation or um, dangling speech parts, like, you know, think of it, you're, you're writing something in your notepad app and it goes too far to the right and then it wraps the line down to the next one and that kind of stuff. And then you hear a text to speech where they just took something that they wrote as notes and then fed it into the computer's text to speech generator and it reads it line by line, not sentence by sentence, but line by line. So it sucks in all these words, spits out the audio of the, the text, and then it sucks in the next line. Well, that means in mid sentence, there's going to be a little pause as it sucks in the next row of text before it spits out the audio. But they fixed that now. Now, and even I have access to this because it doesn't cost anything. You can suck in the text and then create a wave file, like an audio file, where all the pauses are gone. All the dangling words are gone. So it's getting harder to spot it. And I can actually layer that with, let's say, if my picture wasn't down here in the lower right, I could actually uh, narrate all of this in something that sounds, let's say, better than the grammar of this human being. And it would be hard for people that aren't well-versed in software technology to even spot the distinction. Now, in the case of virtual AI-generated avatars, you have to watch what they're doing. If their eyes are always staring straight at you, or they like move a little bit on occasion, like randomly, that's probably computer synthesized. If you see them reading text left to right across the screen, and their eyes go from top to bottom, they're reading a teleprompter. They may be a person with a good voice or a good face or wearing makeup or whatever, and they're clueless as to actually what they're saying. I've actually found sort of supposed sciency YouTube channels where they paid an announcer to just read the teleprompter because the science person who I've seen a picture of is not that uh, photogenic and doesn't have like... Um, the king's English of a voice pattern. But nowadays you can take it even further. You can tell it to read the text with a particular accent. I want somebody that sounds kind of like US Midwest, kind of like a Johnny Carson voice. Johnny Carson was always known for that Midwest voice. You couldn't tell that he was from California or Boston or Massachusetts. He just had this very, you know, non-Southern neutral sounding voice, which was very receptive to an audience. Nowadays, they have computer software that can synthesize that voice. And male or female, and with or without an accent. And you can pick regional accents. But nowadays, not just the voice, but the persona, the, the visual representation of a person speaking. You can actually have that. How do you want them dressed? Do you want them to be uh, Caucasian or not? Do you want them to have an accent from some country or not? And then you feed it your dialogue and it'll do exactly what you see here. Their image will be in the corner, the text or pictures or whatever will be in the background and it will be synchronized to that. But the mouth may not precisely move to the enunciation text. So occasionally it'll be out of sync a little bit. So I've got two links here. 
We're going to go out of shared mode. I'm going to let you hear a really good example from a company who is a subject matter expert in text-to-speech. And then I'll show you an avatar from a company who sells like services. If you want to create yourself a, uh, a podcast of information and you need a good announcer, they can sell you an announcer for your content. Using text-to-speech is becoming more and more common by the day. If you are using Windows 10 or 11, you already have a built-in text-to-speech tool you can check out. Text-to-speech, or speech synthesis, is a form of software designed to improve the accessibility of devices. And today, almost every device has a built-in text-to-speech app you can use. One of the best things about TTS apps is that they sound quite realistic. AI voices are natural sounding, and they significantly improve the quality of the app. Many people use text-to-speech software and voice recognition simultaneously, and it is available on almost every device. Once the text is done, you can use text-to-speech tools to allow the app to read texts and hear how it sounds. So the best way to describe it is no human being actually uttered those words. That was software generated. Note that the pronunciation was very good. Ignoring line breaks, but paying attention to pu uh, punctuation, starting of sentences, ending of sentences, commas and sentences, all that was done in software. That's where we are with speech generation. So the next time you're listening to a podcast and it sounds really good, it may not be a person that ever said those words. Now that's text to speech. Now the next thing is avatars. This is a little easier to um, spot, so to speak. See the guy on the right? Not a person. By using AI Studios, you can create professional videos. Shall we begin? With the help of AI Studios, we can create educational content in the form of captivating videos. We can even produce familiar content by designing an AI tutor modeled after a beloved celebrity. By converting traditional educational content, which was previously composed of text and images, into instructional videos featuring AI tutors, we can anticipate a boost in educational engagement. Okay. Did you notice how the eye blinks were very artificial looking? Did you notice how the hand gestures were gratuitous? That's how you spot them. Okay, and we're back where we were. So it's not to say that text-to-speech, teleprompters, and AI-generated avatars is inherently bad. Sometimes they actually add value to a presentation or that their content is therefore purposefully or assuredly misinformation or misleading, but their use is on the rise. Rather than hiring an on-air personality, or if you want to boost the audience acceptability of your content, uh, these are very inexpensive fees for these things, sometimes free. In the case of text-to-speech, it's free. In the case of uh, uh, AI-generated avatars, it's maybe a couple hundred bucks. But uh, you know, once you have it good, and obviously the text-to-speech audio is getting very good these days, once the AI-generated personas are on the same scale of quality as the text-to-speech, it's going to be hard to spot them because they will essentially pass a Turing test. Most people will listen to it and go, yeah, I think I've heard her elsewhere. It's only because that person that created that content was using the same text-to-speech tool that some other person was using. Now, if you want unique generation, unique voice or unique persona, you can pay thousands of dollars and get unique stuff. But the average content creator won't. But just be aware that more content is going to be synthetic as time goes on. For those that aren't familiar with it, debating skills. Often in uh, junior high or in high school, you'll take a course in debating where you have something you'd like to convince an audience of. Your opponent has something they'd like to convince an audience of. Not necessarily political or religious, just opinions. I think this. He thinks that. The discourse, the um, polite discourse of how one side will sway the other. That's debating. Some people are unfamiliar with it. The people that are unfamiliar with those skills 
are the ones most likely to be swayed by them. The people that are familiar with debating skills are probably exercised themselves during high school or college or whatever. You're going to be the first ones to spot it. The first one is, is almost um, subconscious. You'll be listening to somebody trying to convince you of something, and they'll say, everybody does that, or everybody believes that, or everybody says that. Or they'll go the opposite and say, nobody believes that. No one says that. No one does it that way. These are absolutes. Anytime someone is trying to convince you by way of an absolute, just ignore it like it was not even said, because there's no way to prove it. If you said, everyone believes that, oh, did you take an opinion poll of everyone? No, you're just trying to sway opinion by this giant invisible thing known as everybody or everyone. Well, they all believe it. Why don't you? Or you can flip it the other way around and go, nobody believes that. Oh, you, you did a poll of everybody to know that nobody believes this? So anytime they're absolute in whatever opinion or whatever thing they're stating, um, just never heard that, never saw that. Also be careful of outliers, either for or against it. There's only one person who claims or believes or states something. Um, check for other opinions. Uh, the common phrase is, I've personally never seen that, therefore it can't be true. Really? Well, how much have you seen? Well, I, I personally know that that isn't the way that's done in that, that other country over there. Oh, you've been to that other country? No, but but you know I've never seen it. Like this this one's actually used in the open, so to speak. Bill Maher on his show Real Time says he's actually got a segment called "I Can't Prove It, I Just Know That It's True." He's trying to make light of the fact that you know somebody debating something will say something that they just know it's true. Well, when you ask them for any substantiating information, I don't have any. I can't prove it. I just know that it's true. Okay. Never heard that. Didn't happen. And then you can go the opposite direction and say, it's impossible for that to be the truth because that's too extraordinary. And Carl Sagan's actually quote was, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. It's basically true, but nowadays it's being misused. Anything that somebody wants to say couldn't possibly exist, they'll quote, Sagan. Well, I, I know I've seen a lot of evidence to it, but it's got to be extraordinary evidence. Or, you know, it's not what everybody believes. Therefore, you're going to need to really prove it hard. Um, who establishes these hurdles? What's to say that something is extraordinary? Well, they just made an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary claim. And what's your skill set that says it's extraordinary? Or you've seen lots of evidence. When is uh, the amount of evidence sufficient to cover your claim of extraordinary? Um, yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of evidence for that, but that doesn't prove anything. Huh? <laughs> At one time, there was uh, somebody who claimed that Mars had canals. And since we didn't have any proof of it, sounds plausible. Yeah, I mean, there's canals on Earth. We don't know what's going on on Mars. So, yeah, I see these dark lines. Um, Mars didn't have canals. And then we actually sent probes to go in or fly past or go in orbit around Mars and found out, uh, yeah, there, there, there's some dark areas and light areas, but I don't see no canals. Or at one time, there was a supposition that only our sun has planets going around it. We're just too rare. We're too unique. We're, we're one of a kind. There can't be planets around other stars. And so the people that were saying, you know, these things called exoplanets, I believe they exist. Prove it. Give me, give me some extraordinary evidence. So they went out and they found 5,000 exoplanets. Uh, I guess you're right. I guess exoplanets can exist, but, but there's no life on them. Oh, okay. And then they came up with this concept of a habitable zone. The place where if there is water, it's not boiled off by the heat of their star, their sun, and it's not 
frozen solid because they're so far away from their star. It's in the Goldilocks or the habitable zone. And that was fine. And we found eh, maybe about 30 habitable zone planets uh, orbiting stars similar to our sun, G-type stars. Our star is actually a G2, which means it's not G, it's a little off of G, um, but not quite the next level. So they said, well, maybe there's planets around other kinds of stars. So when the Kepler mission went from its primary mission to the second mission, they said, let's let's take the blinders off, so to speak, and let's look at orange and red stars, orange dwarf, orange dwarf stars and red dwarf stars. So when they started looking at uh, orange and red stars and they adjusted the habitable zone because orange and red stars don't produce as much heat, yeah, they came away with, I think it's around 300 habitable planets now. And now they're narrowing that down further because they're doing spectroscopic analysis of light passing through the atmospheres of these exoplanets. And they're not finding like life because they don't have enough resolution to actually see buildings or roadways or airplanes or anything. But they can sense things in the atmosphere. And when they find certain compounds that are produced on Earth as a result of life existing here, then yeah, that's an indication that exoplanet may have something living around it. There's no indication as to what level of technology. Now, when they start measuring like pollution levels, maybe that's an indication. But uh, yeah, you know, you start out with this Nope, that can't possibly exist. And then uh, maybe it does exist. But, 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 no, no, let's let's keep looking at it. Let's get more evidence. Better results through better um, observations. And then another thing that's attributed to Carl Sagan, but actually dates back to 1888 from a guy named Wilson. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because you haven't seen it yet doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. One time we thought exoplanets didn't exist because we didn't have any evidence of them. Now we have evidence of them. So the absence of evidence of exoplanets was not evidence of the absence of exoplanets. So at what point in time do we have enough negative observations to say, assuredly, something is truly non-existent? It's, it's a threshold. At one time, we were standing firm on the fact that the moon did not have any water. Completely dry as a bone, the solar radiation baked it all off. Like, oh, you mean at the south pole of the moon, where the craters are deep enough that they can always be in shadow, there's ice down there, water ice. So found that. And then when the uh, former Sophia 747 started doing infrared observations, essentially through the surface of the moon, they found that there is a large amount of subsurface water in the moon, underneath the crust of the moon. So, you know, we went from, nope, definitely doesn't have any water to, it's got water, got lots of water. We just didn't see it. Here's another example. Mars was claimed at one time to not have a magnetic field because no visible auroras were observed. Well, on Earth, we can see the auroras, and that lets us confirm, yep, we've got a magnetic field. Look at them, there are auroras. Mars, we're not seeing any visible auroras. Therefore, Mars must not have a magnetic field. Well, if you've observed the auroras on Earth, they have a certain color to them based upon the energy and the magnetic field. And on Mars... The auroras are not in visible light. They're in ultraviolet. But they're there. They're confirmed to exist. But that means that the energy level of the magnetic field was outside the detection threshold of the spacecraft that we had orbiting it that was measuring the magnetic field because we were assuming the magnetic field to be in the same range, same level of amplitude as the Earth. Turns out, slightly different frequency, much lower amplitude, yeah, okay. Let's change that. Some things are not yet observed, but in the future, we may have the ability to observe them. And therefore, 
if you have not yet observed them, state that as not yet detected. That leaves wiggle room for you. If you have a good feeling that, you know, maybe less wiggle room would work, then you can say it's implausible for that to exist. But far too often you'll hear the not possible or impossible. Uh, okay, why? Um, we've never observed it in the, the, the math as we know it, the science as we know it says it's impossible. Sometimes that's true, but oftentimes it's just a great way of slamming the door shut on any future observations. As observing missions are extended and sensor technology improves, it could be those things that say impossible or not possible age like warm milk. If somebody leaves zero wiggle room, then, you know, go fetch your bag of salt. Two that come to mind recently are from the James Webb Space Telescope, bigger telescope than Hubble, out at Lagrange Point 2, can see dimmer things, farther away things, specifically in near and mid-infrared, so the energy levels are different. Wait a minute, that galaxy looks older than, than should be possible. Okay, let's go back and do some confirmation of the observations. Uh, that's kind of hard to do. We only have the one JWST out there. We could have a different science team observe the same thing and see if the processing of the information were different or see if there's a difference in the observation technology at the time the observation was captured. But if it says it's older and somebody reviews the content and says, no, they used the instrument correctly and the instrument was operating and calibrated and, well, then it is what it is. Or it's impossible for a galaxy that forms that early to be that large. You know, because maybe it, it got a bump start on its supermassive black hole and drew in more material. Maybe you had a collision of a couple of black holes when the universe was a lot smaller and that made it bigger. Suffice it to say, yeah, the James Webb Space Telescope, a newer technology instrument that's further out there, that's looking in a specific set of wavelengths, is finding stuff we didn't see before. So the impossible, the implausible, always leave the, the door open for a little wiggle room. And wh whenever there's a description of all the possible, or this is the maximum range this is the minimum of this the maximum of that um is it the smallest or largest lowest energy highest energy that you've ever observed or is it that it's mathematically theoretically impossible to be larger smaller lower energy higher energy we didn't know what pulsars were until we found out that they were neutron stars spinning rapidly and spewing energy um but then we said, well, there's kind of a gap between a neutron star and a black hole. If you get bigger, your stellar collapse, instead of being a white dwarf or a neutron star, results in a black hole. But there's a gap in there. Well, that's a continuum. Shouldn't there be other points along the way? Well, there's thresholds. So maybe there is no midpoint. But then we started finding, oh, there's a midpoint. Well, what do you call these things that are more energetic than neutron stars, but didn't get to the level of a black hole or even a stellar mass black hole, not a, not a you know, galactic core size black hole, but your basic stellar mass black hole. Well, those are quark stars. So the progression of stellar collapse producing white dwarf, further stellar collapse, stripping down the matter and producing neutron stars. Now you further strip down the neutrons to make quarks. What about the next thing? Strip the quarks down until you have predominantly strange type quarks. This is a certain energy level of quark. But then you have another gap that is between strange type quark stars and stellar mass black hole. Is there something between there? Well, that's impossible. Those would have to be top type quark stars. And from what we know about uh, particle colliders, 
we, we've never been able to generate top quarks that last very long. Up until recently, when a collider that wasn't even the Large Hadron Collider produced multiple top quarks. Not a huge quantity of them, just more than one. And they lasted for longer than the previously known duration of a top quark. So, yeah, never, never say never, or never say that's impossible, or never create a progression, you know, one endpoint to another, and then say, I know there's gaps, but nothing can exist in those gaps. And then science has to correct itself when an observation comes along that corrects that. We have one right now with um, photons, extremely low frequencies, extended periods of time, minuscule fractions, fractions of hertz. So you know about frequency, even like gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz, hertz. Did you know it goes all the way down below one hertz? You can have fractions of a hertz, very, very long wavelengths, light year length wavelengths. And the way we detected these is uh, through creation of pulsar timing arrays. This is where we have a bunch of pulsars and we're measuring to a very fine degree the accuracy of the pulsing of them. And as the fabric of space time ripples from a gravity wave expands and contracts, we can measure these differentiations in the timing of the pulsars. And when they're very fast pulsars, we can only measure that difference so far. If they're a little bit slower, we can measure a longer pulse duration. But we run we run up against a ceiling of, we, we can't stretch it out any further because the amplitude, the, the amount of energy in the signal now drops down below the threshold where we can actually detect it. So we're gonna have to come up with newer technology for detecting the low level energy in the very long wavelength. And I think there's a technology out there called uh, microelectromechanical systems or MEMS. They don't so much take a photon, make an electron, and then count the electrons. They take a photon, make it bounce off of a material, and induce through piezoelectric effect energy in the material. And then they measure the electrons off of that. So it's a different technique for measuring much longer. Uh, much longer wavelengths, much shorter frequencies, and uh, much lower energy levels than can currently be done. And so we've got now classifications of gravity wave observatories. We've got the original one, which is the uh, interferometers. This is the, the LIGO Virgo type. We've got lasers that go down a couple of mile long evacuated tubes, bounce off, come back, merge back together, and create a difference in the interferometry pattern. That was the first gravity wave detectors that we had. And then we found out they weren't detecting all of them. So we come up with this new thing where we have pulsar timing arrays. And we're finding that there's a background out there of gravity waves, and we're not measuring all of them. There's more pages in the book, so to speak. So there's a new technique called Mossbauer, where they're actually measuring the recoil of photons as they leave atoms. So when a photon comes in and excites the electron in an atom, the electron moves out and then the electron moves back and a photon comes out. If the photon is moving at the speed of light, what, what about the, the, the sort of F equals MA? I've got this thing that just went zoom off in that direction. Shouldn't the atom recoil? Shouldn't it go like out the other direction? It doesn't. It actually does, but in a very, very small amount. Um, but this is so small that it's considered recoilless. But if you measure the response time, so like photon going in, photon coming out, if you time that, if the atom is moved in space time, then the timing will change. So they've got this new technique of resonance measurement for recoilless effects of photons affecting electrons and coming back out. And that's going to be the next generation of gravity wave detectors because they can detect things well outside the envelope of sensitivity that all the current gravity wave detectors can do. And that the interesting thing is these detectors are not enormous and they can 
detect things quickly. You don't have to wait 21 years like the Pulsar Timing Array did. Improve your instruments, change the technology of your instruments. Your envelope gets bigger. You might detect things that were impossible. Or if all you have is a hammer, everything's got to be a nail, right? Well, there's this thing called a stellar mass black hole. Stellar mass refers to the mass of our sun, our G2 type sun. So a stellar mass black hole would be one stellar mass. But the stellar mass of the sun is not a fixed value. The stellar mass of the sun ranges from 0 0.9 to 1.1, the mass of our sun. So when you hear people talking about, that's a stellar mass black hole. There's little variance in that. It's not a precise like knife edge. It's got to be that number. If a star like our sun collapses down at the end of its life, it will not become a black hole. It'll become a white dwarf. You have to have a sun much larger than ours, much more massive than ours, to create um, a neutron star. And then even bigger to create a black hole. So what's so special about the mass of our sun as being a unit of measure. It's a reference point. So if a black hole is not feeding, in other words, it's not consuming gas or another star or what, and it's a rogue, it's roaming out, it's not part of a galaxy core, it's just roaming out amongst space. If it's not feeding and it's a rogue, it's unlikely we'll detect it. Unless, as it goes past something, we see a gravitational lensing distortion of the background sky, be it galaxy, uh, star clusters or galaxies or individual stars. And that's how we spot stellar mass black holes that are rogues that are just roaming around out there. And there's more than a few of them. Luckily, they're all way far away from us. If you're looking for a uh, rogue planet, that planet's not going to shine in starlight because it's not part of a solar system. So if the only way you say, hey, we just spotted a planet, is optically by, you know, a star shined light on the planet, a planet produced photons that we collected and go, look, a planet. Well, um, if it's a rogue planet, it's going to be very, very cold out in the deep cold of space. And it's going to emit only an infrared. But the infrared telescopes that we have are looking for big things. They're looking for galaxies and star clusters and nebulas and a planet that's a rogue that's emitting an infrared is going to be too small of a point source of infrared light to be detectable by the likes of Hubble Space Telescope, James Webb Space Telescope. You're going to have to have something that is purposefully designed, has particular focal length, field of view, very narrow, very high amplitude in order to be able to detect a rogue planet or a planet at the edge of our solar system that is emitting only an infrared. The other thing that, you know, if you've got hammers, everything is a nail is, uh, and I heard another video this week, um, we found out by the DART mission from NASA that we can take out asteroids and comets with nukes. I don't know how they came to this conclusion, but it's exactly the opposite. If you nuke a rubble pile asteroid, you get a large cloud of things scattering out in all directions. So it'll actually take one potentially hazardous thing and make millions of potentially hazardous things. So be careful when um, one solution fits all because it often doesn't. This one bugs me a little bit is uh, scaling of things. Whenever you see a picture supposedly of an exoplanet and you see this sphere a nice just color swirly yeah atmospheres like there has never been an image of an exoplanet that is so high resolution that we can actually see swirls of gas in the planet's atmosphere it's just an artist going i'm making a pretty picture whenever you see an image from james webb space telescope or in radio astronomy, or infrared, or ultraviolet, or x-rays, none of that is visible to the human eye. Therefore, there are no colors. 
there are only amplitudes of energy, gray scales. The way they become color is they false color or they color map. They pick certain energy levels and then they selectively choose, well, that one's high energy. That one should be brighter. So we're going to make that one like bright red. And th this one's less energy. So we're going to make that like dark blue. And they produce a scale of colors. Often you'll see something referred to as the Hubble palette. That's for the visible range of colors, but they have other predefined palettes for infrared, radio, microwave, UV, and X-ray. Based upon energy levels, you get these colors. One that comes to mind of recent is, if you're watching the latest news reports and you see that there's a hurricane or a potential hurricane down off of Mexico, off the Yucatan, and you see the image they show, they show you the map image, and they show this big, like, fierce, red-orange-looking blob. That's the water temperature. Now, if the water temperature were boiling, um, I could see it being like a fierce red blob. But it's the difference between 89 and 92 degrees between the deep red and the orange. That's not a big difference, but it's a large heat mass over a large area, and therefore it's significant. But the average public looking at that goes, yeah, I wouldn't want to go out there. It looks like it's on fire. No, it's not. It's just that's the color mapping that they've chosen to create a reaction in the audience. And the sizes or densities of collections of things, the old uh, Star Wars adage, of zooming around in the asteroid field, avoiding all those asteroids. Um, they're many miles apart. Their orbits are stable. Collisions are rare. You might occasionally have an asteroid that has a moon of the asteroid. They're not common, but they exist. So if you were to scale down the asteroid belt so that instead of being, you know, many millions of miles across and many thousands of miles between individual asteroids. If you were to shrink that down so it all fit on a display screen, now all those individual items are going to be real close to each other, but they're still going to be pinpoints. So you got to make it look worse than that. So you make all the individual ones about a thousand times bigger than they actually are. The same thing is true of satellites in orbit around the Earth. If they take the Earth and they shrink it down so it fits in the middle of the display, and they shrink down all the all the uh, satellites in orbit, then the orbital layer should be thin like an apple peel around the outside of the Earth. And the individual satellites would not even be visible points. But instead, what they do is they shrink the Earth down, they consolidate all the satellites, but they still leave them like big enough little images so you can see them individually. And they expand out the ring of satellites so that it's like half the diameter of the Earth. But people will look at that and go, we've got way too many satellites in orbit around the Earth. They're just going to run into each other. No. Uh, I think the closest separation is about 10 miles. Uh, larger separations could be uh, 20 to 100 miles. And as you go up in altitude, there can be many hundreds of miles to thousands of miles between the different layers of satellites. And they're still all in orbit around the Earth. As for one satellite being able to see the next satellite down, they're separated by enough distance and the satellites are individually small enough that uh, you know, if you're a low Earth orbiting satellite, unless the other satellite's coming towards you, you'll never see the other satellite. It'll just be, it's got a station, it's got a slot over there. You kind of know it's over there from the math and the information, but can't see it. Now, if it's a big geostationary orbiting satellite, and you're another geostationary orbiting satellite, and your separation is like 100 miles, you might be able to spot the next over geostationary satellite because they're so big and their solar array or their radio antennas are so big, you can spot them. But 
Most satellites can't see each other in orbit. This is another one of my irritants, that uh, content creators will insert unrelated content. So you're watching a video on topic X. And then all of a sudden, you'll see a picture or a video clip of topic Y. Totally unrelated. Why, why are they doing that? Well, the reason why they're doing it is filling. They're filling space. They're filling time. Because if your video is 30 seconds long and that's all you've got to say, then it won't keep your audience. They won't stay interested that long. But if you can make your video four, five, six, or maybe seven minutes long, your scores in the algorithm actually goes up because you've got content that people stay focused on. Well, how do you do that when you've got a short thing to discuss? You throw in filler, and the filler need not be representative of whatever your topic is. I was watching a presentation about rocket boosters, and they inserted a snippet of the space shuttle. But the space shuttle is historical, and we're, we're talking about contemporary boosters like, you know, SpaceX and Blue Origin and, and things like that. Why, why are we bringing up the old stuff? Filler. Or you're talking about rocket boosters, and they'll show you space capsules from Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, or Soyuz. But you're talking about rocket boosters. What has that got to do with space capsules? Filler. So whenever you see filler, just like, okay, I realize that that has nothing to do with what you're talking about. It's just filler. I would say um, take them down a notch in your respect for their content because they're not respecting you that much by just throwing in unrelated filler. They could do a little more work and go get some related content and increase the duration or content, but they just grabbed something that was accessible. Look, here's a pretty picture. Stick that in there. No. Or the, oh, it's kind of the same thing, only different. Sometimes you'll see a caption of a picture in, in, in some video that says, similar, not actual. Oh, okay, why don't you go get the actual and put it in there? Well, because that would take more work. We might have to buy some more stock pictures or video. And uh, uh, we had this. We already paid for this. Let's put this in here. Okay. They want to talk about, let's say, um, something astronomical or something aerospace. Or they want to talk about F-35 fighters. And all of a sudden, you'll see an F-22 fighter. And there'll be no comment. They'll just be like, but but I know a little bit about this. You're talking about F-35s. That's an F-30, F-22. Well, you know, or they're talking about the Andromeda Galaxy. And then they'll throw in a still shot of the Sombrero because it's a pretty looking picture. Like, I that's not Andromeda. Or they're talking about the Europa Clipper mission to deep space. And then they'll insult you by showing you a picture of the moon Titan. Like that that's not Europa. Well, they've they've both kind of got, you know, surface ice and oceans underneath, and the same thing, only different. Now, the distinction will be oblivious to most people, because most people aren't as deep into it as some of us are. But the content creators should know the difference. If they don't know the difference, they don't know their content. But it's kind of a disrespectful to your audience to just slip in something that's not what you're talking about, but fills it. And then you don't actually even say it's similar, but not actual or, or uh, this is Titan. It's not actually Europa. Take them down a notch. So in conclusion, when you're consuming content, consider the source of the content. Look for where they get their information from. Look to see that the information is substantiated. Are they a learned content creator? Are they a subject matter expert? When I did the presentation on the James Webb Space Telescope, I did several weeks worth of coming up to speed on the Space Telescope Science Institute's how JWST works from a science observer perspective so that I could make sure the content that I created actually represented good, healthy details with substantiating sources. Make sure that what you're looking at is evidence-based, not hearsay, not somebody's opinion, just, you know, evidence-based. 
And whatever evidence they provide has some either uh, peer review or consensus to it. Although it's on the rise, always be able to spot synthetic content, whether it's text to speech, um, you know, avatars that are AI generated. Uh, I've got a link at the back that you'll like. It's it's a deep fake of the uh, leader, the elected leader of Canada, basically saying something that was 180 degrees opposite from what he actually said, and it was done on purpose. But that's politics, and we're not going to show that. Learn debating skills and learn how to spot when they're being used on you. Look look out for a purpose use of absolutes. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Be concerned about unrealistic hurdles. Like, you know, that can't be evidence of that. It's got to be better evidence than that. Like, how much do we need? Be on the lookout for unrelated filler content. And when a creator disrespects their audience by showing them stuff that doesn't match. Always keep a supply of salt nearby. Nothing is 100% anything. Scrutinize for biases. Hey, I went on a, a trip to uh, uh, this spaceport and I got to see these rockets and I spent 15 minutes with this name-worthy, name-dropping person and therefore you should believe everything I say. No. Being a consumer and having to look out for all these things is not easy. But given that we can't change the creators of the content to make them better, We've got to have better consumers so that we're not swayed by whatever great gray level there is out there. And we come away with like, it's the end of everything or this changes everything. No, it doesn't. And then we have links. I actually found this first article here public awareness of science. There was actually a Wikipedia where it has a bunch of different links of how much or how little the public knows about various aspects of science. And as a content creator, you know, don't throw a lot of math on the page and just to presume everybody has a degree in calculus. Don't start spouting technical word salad, try and explain or have links that people can go find more information about. And I also found an article relating to how public lack of knowledge is balanced against social media's lack of accurate content. And then just a, uh, uh, over in Great Britain, they had a uh, article regarding fake science and the knowledge crisis. This is well, well intended content creators faking science because somebody wants a grant or somebody wants their grant money renewed so they'll kind of fudge things a little bit for you and people won't notice it. And then later on when they notice it, they get real angry because you're supposed, you're supposed to be all seeing, all knowing on this subject. And here we find out later you were faking it in order to keep your grant money going. Okay. And then as I mentioned earlier, uh, yeah, governments can keep a secret, at least for a while, decades. Uh, so you can look up the Glomar Explorer. And then if you doubt that why, why would a government pay somebody to inject known misinformation? Like, ignore the man behind the curtain. Look, the light's better over there. Look, I'm shining the light. You can look up. There's actually a content on something called Mirage Men and Richard Doty being one of them. And then somebody actually, I didn't know about this until I started looking for the background of it. Somebody else out there is, how do you, counteract misinformation I compared notes with them and then if you want the details uh the speechify website pretty cool when when you listen to some of the text to speech they do it you, you listen to five minutes worth of text spoken by one of their uh, software packages and you forget that it's a computer speaking it just sounds so warm and real and yeah. And then the, the deep brain, um, that's the uh, AI generated avatar speaking content. Uh, those are not quite as advanced, but I would suspect that in the next 
two to maybe five years, they'll be at the same level that Speechify is for text-to-speech. You'll be watching a news program like Nightly News, and instead of paying $20 million a year for a newscaster, you can have the same content creators dump their content into an uh, an AI-generated avatar to read the news for a million dollars a year. So the profit motivation is definitely there. And if you look to the last contract that the actors, producers, and directors had last year, you'll find that one of the terms of the contract was, you're not going to replace us with them bots, are you? Well, I don't know what the actual details of that are, but I can't believe that there would be a corporate incentive to not do that at the lowest level, maybe not at the highest level. But there was once a movie called Final Fantasy where all of the characters in the movie were computer generated. The voices were all from actors, but all the people like things that you see, there were no weird space aliens. They were all human and they all had different skin tones and different like colorations on their skin and that was the first test of you know if we do this right we don't need to pay them actors no initial money no residuals no promotional money we can just have it do it so if, if you're familiar with max headroom think back to max headroom and they found out that except for a few scenes the CGI just wasn't good enough. So they had the actor dress up in the appearance of Max Headroom because he could do the verbalization faster. I was watching an interview with an actor recently where they were doing a character that was computer generated. And they remember when they first started doing this, they would do their lines. They were doing the motion capture outfit kind of thing. And they would see over on the computer display, the live computer display, a stick figure, like representing their body movements. She recently did one where um, um, the computer generated creature was actually in real time to her acting. So she was wearing the motion capture outfit. She looked like a person with a lot of stuff stuck on them and you know, cameras pointing at them. And then over here on the director's live display was that creature in the background that they're supposed to be in in the movie, just at a slightly reduced resolution. But when she would move in real time, the creature would move in real time. The next step is, why do we need this high paid actor? Yeah, it's going to get there. So learn to spot deep fakes and learn what a Turing test is. That way, when you're amazed after the fact, when you watch something or you listen to something and you can't tell it's not a person and then learn later on that it wasn't a person, you just pass the Turing test. You couldn't distinguish it. Now, in debating skills, how to spot a bad argument or you know, how do you spot it when somebody's using debating skills against you? Um, the two Saganisms of extraordinary um, claims require extraordinary evidence and evidence of absence is not absence of evidence or absence of evidence is not absence of existence. Um, and then that new technique for gravity wave via um, photon recoil resonance, which I got to read more about that. That that looks, I got to see somebody actually, you know, peer reviewing and trying that and doing it in a couple of places because that's going to lead to like desktop gravity wave detectors, which I think would be great if instead of having to spend millions to billions of dollars creating gravity wave detectors that detect only very narrow bands of gravity waves, you now have a single gravity wave detector that can be a desktop device that would detect wide ranges of gravity waves. And then it's when we find out Gee, much like there's a microwave background, there's a gravity wave background. Okay. As I can often say, I had fun doing that one. <laughs> Cook.
comments, questions? Yeah, th these uh, artificial speeches and, and avatar people, hmm? it's not necessarily bad. No, I, I, like I said, they're on the improvement. Hmm. And eventually they're going to realize, gee, that's a lot cheaper than actually hiring people to do that stuff. Or you can get a synthetic personality that is more appealing to your audience. Remember, when they pick a newscaster, uh, they want a man who's tall, slim build, doesn't have gray hair, um, maybe wears contact lenses, but certainly no glasses, speaks with that Johnny Carson Midwest accent. That's, that's a filtering process. That reduces the number of different human possibilities that you're going to have, which means you're going to have to pay them more because they're more unique. But the moment you can just say, I want a newscaster type A personality, male, uh, U.S. And you can get one for a reasonable price, not millions, not even hundreds of thousands, maybe 10,000, maybe a few thousand. If you can cook up one of those things and you don't mind other people, other like content creators using a clone of your exact persona, that's going to be fine. But you know the the big the big content creators, they're going to pay the extra. So instead of spending a thousand dollars for an avatar that anyone else can select from the the collection, they're going to spend five or ten thousand dollars and get one unique to their channel. At some point, you won't be able to tell the difference. I can still tell the difference because I have experience in these sorts of things dating back to the nineteen eighties. Yeah, until it gets better, then you can't tell. Yeah. yeah. Speechify, I worked with a number of years ago when I was doing um, medical device interoperability. And Speechify was used by physicians dictating radiological exams. So when um, an orthopedic surgeon was reviewing an exam, he would speak into a little mini tape recorder and then they would download the audio from the mini tape recorder back then it was even on tape they would digitize it download it into the speechify software and the software would create the report text for the physician and the software that did this speech to text had to understand all the medical jargon of an orthopedic surgeon to get the right words, because the, the, the surgeon's just doing his 10,000th this year review, and he, uh, he kind of clips some of the words. And, but the software had to get it right, spell things out, so to speak. So that was text to uh, sorry, speech to text. The text to speech was in another job that I worked at doing medical device alarm management, where... Um, Hospitals used to have PA systems, you know, the overhead speaker system. And whenever there was a particular kind of coded alarm, they didn't want just any old person on the floor saying that. They wanted to take the text of the event with all the parameters and then have the text generate a very easy to understand, non-emotional alarm message. Code blue, room 127. And it would sound so calm and collect. And you'd see all the people in the floor like mad dashing to the room. Like, what's going on? Uh, a person's life is in jeopardy in that room. How would I know that? You heard that nice calm voice say code blue in that room number? That was it. So I work with Speechify as a, a client of our system to take text Massage, we would massage it around and then inject it into Speechify and produce a WAV file and then play the WAV file over the PA system. So, yeah, I've been around this stuff for a while. Hmm. You don't have to be exposed to stuff for stuff to come into existence and be advanced. And then one day it's just there. And you see some poor example and you go, well, it's never going to be good enough to fool me. I bet you I can go on a YouTube channel and show you something where you go, yeah, that guy's pretty good. He, he seems to know what he's talking about. 
first of all, that's not a human voice. Second of all, that's not a person. And now in the era of artificial general intelligence, you don't even have to create the content. You can just say, today's subject matter is this, go write me a, you know, an eight minute long PowerPoint. And then I want an avatar to speak it. And I want a voice from the Midwest to say it. And, <laughs> and you know, a couple hours later, -da, there's your re pre-recorded video. So whenever you see one of these videos of, you know, the person speaking with the microphone like this, and they're always staring into the camera, it's like, those are the ones that are most likely to be first replaced by computer synthesization Ooh. because they're so easy to do. Me, on the other hand, uh, everything's wrong. Everything's normal. <laughs> you know, I do have a circle light, but I don't use it. I do have a pedestal microphone that I bought the thing and then realized I don't need that. I've got a courtroom transcription microphone sitting over here in the corner. It seems to do fine. Um, I don't wear contact lenses. I have gray hair. I'm just wearing a t-shirt. I pick different t-shirts with different like coloring on them. Uh, today's red. How can we be I, sure that you're not, we don't know that you're really not artificial? Because I have 10 fingers. Have you, have you seen the, the, the bad example AI? The bad example AI where it synthesized a person and they had like their hand here like this and they had six fingers on their hand. <laughs> like, yeah, not quite there yet, but how many people noticed that? Oh, not a lot of people noticed that. I noticed it like I can count to six. But uh, you know, you'll see things like that or separations like um right now kind of this side of my face is more lit up than this side of my face and if that was ai generated you might actually see a little seam in my forehead whereas it's uniform wrinkles and all mm. so just you know much like you can't control all the media content so just realize the onus is on you, the consumer, to realize when something's gone awry. Well, same thing's true as when they start using fully generated content. Spot it. And, you know, if it's good content, fine. It's okay if it's generated. If it's questionable content or they don't give you their sources or their sources turn out to be not good, um, Send them a comment. Unsubscribing from you. Content is not accurate. Bye-bye. And then just, you know, unfriend, unassociate, unfollow, whatever. And if you're paying them by a Patreon or something like that, definitely stop paying them. Ooh. Now, it's not universally across. So you might say, eh, I, I found a couple of YouTube channels that, that, I'm gonna I'm gonna not, not gonna watch those anymore because their content's bogus. That doesn't mean you should label all YouTube content that way, because there's some good content out there. I've even found a PBS content on YouTube that's like, really? You guys ought to update that. But that doesn't mean I'm going to completely disrespect PBS, that particular speaker, or all of YouTube. You know, watch or beware. I used to watch some uh youtube science videos and it was narrated by a machine and you could tell yes. and it was, it was so uncomfortable to listen to even though the content was exciting the visuals were nice yep. but i just couldn't stand listening to these machines talking at me but you heard that woman the the speechify synthesized female voice earlier yes yeah, if better that now. was the voice you'd probably have a different opinion like they've got a really good narrator I can understand everything she said. And then later on, you find out that be no human, that be computer. Mm. Mm. Which is which is why I so enjoyed changing my Amazon Alexa from Alexa to computer. Uh, that way I can be like on Star Trek and I can say computer and it does things. <laughs> but that's me. It's taking my voice, converting it to text 
analyzing it via AI, producing a result, and then she comes back in a very pleasant voice and goes, okay, or <laughs> unable, I'm unable to talk to that device or unable to communicate with that device. And I go, canned answer number three. Wouldn't it be nice if uh, she sounded like Robbie the robot? You know, I can, you, you can actually, you can not Robbie the robot, but robotic. You can actually configure Amazon Alexa to produce a robotic voice. Oh, gee. <laughs> and si since I grew up in the era of text to speech by computer robotic synthesis, like, I don't want to hear that anymore. Now, are you looking forward to the day that they do become so talented with AI that they could replace you with AI? So you would be able to tell them the topic that you wanted to, to talk about and produce the, the content for Saturday night. See, I think you would dislike that totally. My personal opinion is you enjoy looking up all this information. And I don't foresee that AI would ever go down the rabbit hole as you do. So <laughs> it and may not be that's, that's what keeps me unique is there are so many other content providers out there that they'll produce two or three items per week. And eventually it just becomes a machine. And when their content is so readily generated and so readily produced, um, they're more susceptible to being replaced by a machine than me who does it, you know, one evening a week. And then it takes me anywhere from one to four days to edit that and put it up on YouTube. But my content is less well rehearsed, more scatterbrained. <laughs> um, and so it's going to be a lot more difficult to create something that looks like um, an avatar that has my style. But as far as research, um, I've, I've got an, an open AI account and I have once ask it to research something for me it cannot yet do as good a job as i can do in a couple of quick searches mm -hmm. when it gets that good at researching for me then i will i won't be afraid of being replaced i will be concerned that my content is so trivially created i you know i don't feel like there was effort to go out and look for this information, to pull it together, to get the hyperlinks, to verify the content in the hyperlink, um, verify my sources. You know, I would just presume that if it went off and got me the content, somehow it would do that. But at the moment, they don't do that. The same sort of raw Wikipedia text that I might grab and then later on analyze, they'll just grab and not analyze. So... I'm a lot safer at being replaced than is, let's say, a nightly news broadcaster or a very popular YouTuber. Um, they're going to be replaced far sooner than me. In fact, they will rise in popularity and then I will be given disdain for not looking as good or as polished as them. I've had people... But I went, when I was doing these online sessions for the observatory, um, I had people that didn't have any experience creating content that said, get, you got to get one of those big microphones with the spit guard and put it right in front of you. Like, no, I don't. No, I don't. Yeah, but you, yeah, but you need one with a, it's got to be on a stand with a big XLR cable coming out of it on a big spring loaded boom arm. And it's got to have a, big, you know, windscreen, you're indoors, but it's got to have a big windscreen and a spit guard and like, no. Well, that's all the fun. <laughs> well, you know, they'll complain that I don't um, value my audio quality enough. I, I can look over there and see that my voice going into the microphone, going into electronics, coming out into Zoom says, uh, you know, it's yeah, no, it sounds fine. Yours, your audio is fine. Yeah. Yeah. So now the thing I, is, 
is that you don't but, see the Topsy Roxy cop falling after AI. And, and some of the fan that gets people popular is the fact that their audience wants to find out more about their private life or they <laughs> want to know the characters more than that, that they don't want to think that they're watching an AI and they're falling in love with this character on TV and they're not real. Well, I've got a slide for that. So if anybody says, who is that idiot? Um, I've got an entire slide about the idiot that I am. <laughs> what my skill sets are, my education, uh, some of my personal experiences in astronomy and uh, you know, things like that. So, An AI wouldn't have this page. <laughs> Not yet. Oh, so what do you think the AI would make up a page? Well, because they wouldn't be able to say that they... No, 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 no. A person cool. would make up a false history for an AI-generated bot. They would make up... Well, they definitely history. would. They definitely would. If I'm... Oh, if so I'm you wouldn't know that they were... A, you wouldn't know that they were AI, then. I would. At least for now, I can still easily spot it. Yeah, but I'm saying we're we're in the six years from now, and now AI is um, having newscasters. You're saying yes, that it, it would be it would be replace newscasters. Now, are they going to replace a newscaster without a newscaster saying I'm being replaced by AI? I think no. it would get out there that they would no. say I'm being replaced. It, AI, it, it'll, it'll get out there, and the general public won't really care about it. They do, they're just watching it for the news. When they replace one newscaster with a person you don't know that is now the new newscaster, you can't say, bring back the old one. Because they won't. Because that person's already gone. But what they'll do is they'll try and promote the new one. So you go to the website of that program and they'll have an entire backstory about how wonderful this new newscaster is. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not true. Well, but it can't be true at all, promoting. right? Because it's not a person. But they'll make that stuff up. So you can't say it's sort of true and not true. It's all going to be all fake stuff then. But yes. why, I don't know how that, I don't know. Oh. That just seems sort of um, very strange to me. That that, because I don't believe that you can keep everything quiet that people would not you touch your ears. Yeah. They, they won't care about whether it's quiet or not. Because the vast majority of the people watching their content, uh, they're there for the content. They're not there for the persona of the individual. Yeah, and you you, ha you, you don't talk to people and they say, I like my newscaster so-and-so. They're, they're more like, I watch Channel 6. I went and watched Channel 10. You know, uh -huh. I, 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 I don't know, you know. Well, remember, remember, I grew up in the era when if I want local news, I want to listen to Ralph Rennick. Yeah. Yeah. Or I want national news. I'll listen to Walter Cronkite. Exactly. Now, weirdly enough, those are both on the same channel, the same network. But back then, it wasn't a matter of is that left leaning or right leaning or that sort of stuff. It was just that exactly. the person that I listen to and trust. Yes. Now, am I going to listen to and trust an AI? That I'm going to because you're still going to have like seven stations that have the news on, right? Yeah, yeah. they're going to be wanting my my time on this channel versus that one. So how are they going to attract me if it's not a real person? I have a better AI than you do. They already track you. No, I'm saying do they? I I, I track them. Huh. I'm saying will I be no. watching no. this eventually, channel eventually, versus eventually. that? Channel? After they break through and get acceptance by the general public, it won't matter. Okay. You'd be watching it for the content. You could care less what the persona is. I, I don't know. I, I think uh, are interested in, in the person that's giving the presentation. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. you giving a presentation. That's right. There was, there was a uh, very well-known newscaster who was once called to task for reading all his news off a teleprompter yes. written by a newsroom, you know, full of people yes. who are writers. And he's just said, so what? So I read it. Yep. Yep. Okay, people tune in to me. They like my personality. And I'm just reading what it says on the teleprompter. And he admitted it. And, and everybody went crazy. Yep. But that's okay. But I'm saying he still was a real person. 
Yeah, he was. Yeah. And people want more. Well, yeah. Have you ever seen the movie Broadcast News? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. In Broadcast News, they had a newscaster who was doing work in the field. Excellent journalist. But they would not promote him to the anchor desk because he didn't look suave and debonair enough. Right. He didn't have the right appearance. Uh huh. But he knew all about the news. He could give you details and facts, and he knew all the contacts. And but they couldn't put him on the air because they would lose ratings. Yeah. So what they did was they hired a guy who, eh, you know, he's he's kind of an actor. Not really a journalist, but but he looks good, and he's got local news channel experience. Where he was just the guy on the channel, you know, that looked good, and so he got promoted to network news, and now they want to make him the anchor to replace the Walter Cronkite like anchor. So they were counting on the persona, despite the fact that he wasn't a journalist and didn't have knowledge, to just read what's in the teleprompter. And he did. That's good enough. And they've even made jokes about that. Um, Ron Burgundy. If you know who Ron Burgundy is. Yeah. Uh, he's the guy that just reads the teleprompter doing the news. And the people at the station would knowingly put junk lines in the teleprompter just so oh. he would read them without thinking about it. And we, it would never occur to him to even think about it. He would just read. Right. So, yeah, there there are people that use teleprompters. I don't use a teleprompter. I use PowerPoint. It's sitting right in front of me. Um, <laughs> but my point being is, is that people were looking for the person that they preferred to look at. Now, you're saying that AI will produce this person that they prefer to look at. But it's because they think it is a person. Yes. They don't think it's an AI person. I mean, AI generated being that actually, even thinking that, that the AI had skipped over the fact of us thinking about having to write up what they're saying. The fact that they have they didn't have any people involved. I mean, the fact that he had somebody in the, the room, you know, he had human beings going out and getting the information. I don't believe any newscaster does all the research on whatever no. they're doing. I believe they get it from other people and they put it together or somebody's putting it together for them and yeah. they're looking over it and reading it to us. And they believe whatever they're reading to some extent, yeah. um, you know, even though the head honchos might be saying you have to say this or that, yeah. but mostly they're not in disagreement with the channel or they don't stay with it, you know, type thing. Yeah. But we believe in that person that we're watching. If, if you see in the credits for a particular program, and it might be a noteworthy program. If you see in the credits where it says, you know, the newscaster in their name, and then you see producer in their name, that's quite normal because the producer is producing the content that the newscaster is reading. If the next line down, you see editor. Okay, well, that's a guy that sort of oversees all the programs and right. keeps everything lined up. If the next line you line down, you see is writer, uh, that's just a person that creates content. They're not necessarily a journalist and they're not necessarily being fact-checked. They're just <laughs> writing. So I Which would say- AI? Listing it as writer or AI? The writer can be replaced by AI today. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when the writer writes the words that the editor approves, that the producer just, you know, shapes the topic by requesting the AI generated and then gives it to the newscaster who turns out to not even be a person, but just feeds it into the newscaster AI bot and they read it. Um, yeah. If they get that good, will people care? No, they're just listening to the content, which goes back to the days of radio before television. Not that I was there, but Radio. Yeah, you had a radio announcer that was a person. Correct. But you didn't care what they looked like. All you cared about was they're saying something. They're being paid to give you news. They had a good voice for giving you the news. They spoke clearly. And 
if they said something, you could talk to other people and they would have the same consensus of opinion and therefore it was news. Yeah, but that doesn't mean they didn't care about how they look. People would make in their imagination what they thought the person looked like if they didn't. Exactly. It's, 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 it's very similar to when um, movies were no talking, you know, yeah. no music, no voices, and you had these great actors and you thought they were really great actors and then they invented talkies and you heard the voice speaking and that did it, it made nails on chalkboards. And those people, even though they were great actors, they didn't last long when talkies came out. And in fact, sometimes they would even do dialogue replacement and have somebody else speak what the person's saying in order to keep that visage of the actor in front of you. But that, that costs extra money. So why don't we well, just get an actor that looks good and sounds good? But when they did that and it was economical, say, because they knew they could sell that person and they couldn't sell the person who actually spoke. Right. They, they but they were still selling a human being. It wasn't. And, and when that people found out that that person wasn't the person who was singing the song, such yep. as with um, Julie Andrews, who was being faked into some other actor, yep. people rebelled against it. They didn't like the fact that they were not having the real actor who was singing, sing the song. Not always, because it wasn't always caught on. But with Julie Andrews, it did get caught on and people did rebel against it. But nowadays, you don't even think about it. They actually put that in the credits. You know, actor such and so, voiced by, and then the, the person who actually sung the song or whatever. Because sometimes you get an actor that looks good and the dialogue's good, but just don't have the singing pipes. So sure. they'll bring in somebody else to uh, automatic dialogue replace of ADR, the singing. And it sure. sounds wonderful. And then in the credits, you see the actor was this as sung by, and then the person thing who sung it. And they'll get somebody noteworthy, some, you know. Yeah, I used to sing a little Frank Sinatra songs. Nobody okay. knew. <laughs> yeah, but only in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, I thought that would be fun tonight. Yeah, it was. It was very good. A little, a little break from the science fact stuff. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Okay, anything else before I stop recording? Oh, stop recording, good. <laughs>